I can pretty much guarantee that you've heard someone say something along the lines of, uh, I'm so addicted to my phone, I'm so addicted to pizza, or I'm so addicted to the internet, I just can't live without it. But is that an addiction? And if not, what's the difference? Well, it's a good question. The National Institute of Drug Abuse says that substance use that's chronic and compulsive that occurs despite physical or social harm and that causes long-term changes to the brain classifies addiction. In the DSM-5, addiction is something that causes the physical process of withdrawal and tolerance. But if you're a little clever, you might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, what about other things that cause physical or social harm that people can't stop doing? And that can be where addiction gets fuzzy because a lot of different things act on the system that addiction does, our reward system. It's called the mesolimbic system inside your brain. And this reward system responds to a lot of things. It responds to social media. It responds to anything you like doing on your phone. It responds to sugar and fat and salt. Anything that makes you feel rewarded has to do with the mesolimbic system. Highly processed foods actually act on the mesolimbic system so significantly that there's been a scale developed to look at food addiction, specifically the Yale Food Addiction Scale. When German researchers actually tried this scale on a population, they did find individuals that had food addiction. Interestingly, a lot of these people were on the poles of the weight spectrum. They were either extremely underweight or overweight. But this also raises an interesting question. There's a lot of overlap between food addiction and different eating disorders, like binge eating disorder and bulimia and anorexia nervosa. So if these cases of food addiction exclusively occur in people with eating disorders, then it could be a symptom of eating disorders. But it's not that simple because it doesn't exclusively occur in eating disorders. This has led researchers like Robert West to propose the idea of something called para-addiction, something that is behaviorally very similar to addiction, but doesn't necessarily have the same changes to the brain seen with substance use. But if food addiction can still be dangerous, then why do we need a different word for it, like para-addiction? Well, that largely comes down to the fact that you need a diagnosis to get treatment, but there's also limited funding given towards addiction. Treating the two like they're the same, if they're not, means that funding for two different issues has to be divided amongst the two. So processed foods work on the same reward system that drugs do. The only difference is they just take advantage of our natural tendency to like those sorts of foods more because naturally we're supposed to think that they increase our odds of survival. And our brain loves that. But you get dopamine from something else too something probably in your pocket and almost as universal as our need to eat. Cell phone can also be a big source of dopamine, so maybe your parents are right and you're addicted to that too. But I think I can convince you pretty quickly that it's not actually your phone you're addicted to. Imagine that you're in the middle of nowhere, you go to reach for your phone, and it's dead. Or worse, it just doesn't have a signal. Is that evil time-sucking parasite still giving you dopamine? Probably not. Odds are you're probably addicted to the internet or an app on your phone or that rush you get from a couple likes on that photo. But even then, you're not necessarily getting any more dopamine from that than you would if, you know, you experienced those things. In real life, someone complimented you or you did something else that you enjoyed. That's why people have suggested the term of problematic use instead of addiction for cell phones. Else suffers from something else like depression or anxiety and their world shrinks to their cell phone, then yeah, it might become their sole source of dopamine, but it still is behaving in a natural way for that system. It's just not able to compare to the real deal. But maybe that's clear as mud and you still don't understand. Let's go back to those two words from the DSM-5, tolerance and withdrawal. Most people have some idea of what tolerance means. As you take a drug for longer, you'd need more of it in order to get the same effect. But it goes deeper than that. 
it goes into why do you need more of it to get the same effect. This wave represents what dopamine is doing in your brain during tolerance. When substance use starts, you get that peak and then a drop and you return to baseline. But as use is prolonged, the baseline actually gets lower and lower. And all of a sudden, the peak gets closer and closer to your original baseline. And this shows us how withdrawal happens. In the short term, withdrawal is coming down and it's returning to below baseline. But long-term withdrawal means that an individual's baseline, their general feeling of reward and satisfaction with their life throughout the course of a substance addiction gets lower and lower and lower. And that's the relationship with tolerance and withdrawal that we don't always understand. Substance use starts, sobriety and baseline dopamine levels are exactly the same as everybody else. As addiction takes hold, all of a sudden, baseline dopamine levels get lower and lower, and quality of life gets lower and lower. So hopefully you can see why substance addiction, para-addiction, and problematic behaviors aren't the same. They might act on the same system, but two of them act in a relatively natural way. They use the system as it exists, naturally. Substance addiction, however, actually changes the system and desensitizes it to dopamine and causes a cycle of use. And if that's still totally unclear, just keep in mind that substance addictions change the brain. Para addictions and problematic behaviors act on an existing structure in the brain.